<laughs> so everybody, how are you tonight? This is Uncle Bruce coming to you, talking to you with Juvenile. How are you, Juvenile? I'm fine, Bruce. Thank you. What about you? And uh, hi, everybody. It's a huge pleasure to to be back. And today we're going to talk about one of your favorite topics, huh? Of course, of wine. course. For wine, <laughs> for sure. Because wine, because when we are talking about wine, there are some topics that follows that follow wine topic like uh, gastronomy, food, good things, you know, Jesus. music, <laughs> cheeses, yeah, yeah, yeah. Travel. Yeah, good music, you uh -huh. know. <laughs> okay, well, the article today that we're talking about is going to be uh, this one here, and I'll show you the, the topic here. I'll share my screen with you just a moment here. So share my screen. And here and here. So this is the, the article today we're talking about is France has too much wine. It's paying millions to destroy the leftovers. So yeah, why do we want to talk about this today? Uh, there are many reasons. But wine is a very nice beverage. It's a very nice drink. And the government is paying the wine makers, the wine growers, money to not produce the the crop. So what's up with that? Yeah, yeah. So there is something that I I, I would like to mention before. Uh, when I was reading this article, for me, what was very interesting to see new words and see you know as a everlasting English learner <laughs> for me it was very interesting to see new words to to learn mm -hmm. you, you know so my my tip today for our audience is it's very it's very good and very useful to read um, articles from newspaper or magazines because you can improve your uh, vocabulary, you know? It's mm -hmm. just a tip. For me, it was very, very useful. So back to the topic. Uh, the point is, which for me was very, uh, a big surprise, you know? Uh, for the number one is the consumption of uh, uh, wine around the world or, or even in France, mm -hmm. is decreasing, which for me was a big surprise because mainly because of the pandemic where people start to drink a lot <laughs> uh, was a surprise. So the, this is the number one. The number two is the, the crisis uh, that started of uh, Ukraine war and uh, the breakdown we can we can say breakdown of uh, supplies to to make wine like bottles and other stuff and uh uh i think the, 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 this is the, the this this is the this are the two main reasons uh well, so mm -hmm. yeah so I, no, no. I saw the uh, information that was shared in the article. It says in 1926, the average French citizen drank 136 liters of wine. Every <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's a lot of wine. That's like exactly. having a bottle of wine uh, more than every two days. Like every two and a half days, you're drinking a bottle of wine. <laughs> One person. Okay. One, One person. person. One That's person. a lot of wine. Of course, you have to produce a lot of wine for that to happen, too. But that's a lot of consumption across the society of France. Uh, but now they say that the number is down to 40 liters of wine per year. That's a drop yeah. of about, what, more than 65%, um, or around 65% exactly. drop in consumption. So they don't need to produce as much wine. But then, like you said... The wine costs more to produce now because of the ingredients, about all the support of the bottles, the fertilizer, everything costs a lot more. So 
there's a, a lot of impact from a little a lot of areas. They even included the idea of the Ukraine war was causing some problems because yeah. of the grain that they used to produce the wine. So, you know, there's a lot of reasons. Of course, climate uh, change is another one. And then the yeah. habits. Uh, they said that uh, since the pandemic, that the the amount of wine was reduced in the consumption because the restaurants were closed, the bars were closed, um, and people were just not going out because they could not go out to mm -hmm. drink their wine, eat their food. They had to drink in the house. And, you know, I'm not a person that likes to drink alcohol in my own home unless I'm drinking with somebody, like in a social uh, atmosphere. I don't drink alcohol by myself normally. Unless it's a hot day, I'm working hard, and I want a cold beer or something like that. You know? <laughs> I don't drink wine just by myself. Uh, my wife and I don't drink wine during our dinner. Do you drink wine at your dinner, Juvenile? Sometimes, sometimes, yeah, yeah. Depends on depends on the 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 dish or the you know the food we 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 eat or taste, you know. Because that's the point. Wine actually follow good food. That's the point. For example, you don't you don't open a bottle of wine to see your football team or your soccer team on TV because you know. It's not funny, <laughs> you know. It's a it's a quite different drink from beer, for example. Well, I think you know? that I think beer is probably consumed more during a football game than wine. A wine is more exactly a relaxed drink. You know, when you sit down and have conversation, it's not so much okay. Let's watch the team. What's going on? It, and that's more of a beer drink, okay? Or maybe exactly, exactly. <laughs> But wine is more of a sophisticated drink, huh? Yeah, for sure. For sure. It's necessary the right atmosphere for that, you know, the right environment or the right moment to to taste or to enjoy a bottle of wine, you know. Well, it's interesting that the government is going to pay for the wine to not be produced. And so exactly. the, the wine producers are they are in a situation where they need to take some of the existing wine that they have and to produce alcohol for other purposes. They indicated perfume and other mm -hmm. things that they would use the the alcohol for, but it would not be for drinking as a wine. It would be mainly for alcohol. And then the wine that could be produced this year they're going to diminish, reduce the amount of wine to be produced to keep the, the price at a good level. You know, because there's yeah. supply and demand. If you have more supply, then demand, the, the, the price goes down. If you have less demand, and if you have a lot of demand and you don't have the product, then your price goes up. But if you have a lot of product or don't have a lot of product, then your price can go up because the demand is high. But there's not enough to go around, so the price goes up. So that's what they're looking to do: is to give the the you know the farmers for the grapes, give them money to not produce wine in some areas, in some quantities. And I started thinking about that. You know, they do this in the United States too, and I'm pretty sure the governments around the world do that for the agricultural producing company uh, countries like Brazil, maybe the United States, and others. They tell the farmer, don't grow your, your crop this year. We will give you mm -hmm. some money. We will give you money, and you don't grow. You just receive the money. Because if you produce, it's going to put too much product into the, uh, the, the markets, and then the price is going to go down, down. And then it's not going to make it economical for the farmers to do the farming. They're going to say, hey, I'm not making a profit. I'm not going to do this. So that's mm -hmm. what that's. So that's one thing that they're talking about. And then also they mentioned about the the mildew and the mold on the grapes because of the climate change. You know, grapes grow at a a unique temperature, a unique um, amount of water that goes into the soil. It's a very complicated uh, crop to do well, to grow yeah. good grapes for creating wine, champagne, and other products like this. 
it's not just, okay, I'm going to plant some grapes and I'm going to grow some grapes. No, <laughs> there's a lot to it. A lot of science goes into making good grapes. And so now with the climate change, the grapes are not doing as well. You know, they have exactly. more mildew and it causes the grapes to, to not do well. And so the taste is not excellent like they want. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. And uh, it's interesting because uh, when you are uh, you are uh, talking about this, I remember uh, a few years ago in Brazil, we had uh, some uh, some crisis in agriculture uh, because of the the weather uh, as well. And uh, the producers of uh, onions, you know, had a uh, breakdown on their uh, crop, not crop. Uh, profit the, margin? The harvest. Oh, the harvest, okay. In the harvest, yeah. So, and uh, there were a lot of uh, losses for them, for agriculture, but... Uh, the the harvest that remained at that at that time and uh, the agriculture decided to not sell and destroy because they would spend uh, a lot of money to distribute or to you know to deliver um uh, their their uh, production to 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 market and uh, was not uh, economical. Economical, exactly. So, but it, at, at, at first sight, it's very weird. You yes, know? very strange. But when you start yeah. thinking about the economics of the situation, the government needs to make some good choices and good decisions, because the markets can be very, very bad for the market for the. Uh, um, well, the, the investors, it could be very mm -hmm. bad for the farmers, it could be very bad for the import export of a country. So there are a lot of factors why a government tells the people, the farmers, destroy the crop. It's like, well, man, there are a lot of hungry people. Give it to them. Exactly. <laughs> that, that, this is a paradox, you know. Yes. Very, very <laughs> this crazy. This is a paradox. Yeah. Very crazy. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I think uh, it, it, that's the point I I I found that was uh, very interesting to talk about this because I think this situation uh, uh, will be more uh, fre frequent frequently we will see more frequently this in in our existence in our lives you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not you're, only you're not only with right. yeah not only with wine but uh, another stuff i was reading another article that was talking about the the risk of uh, uh or the, the the food that are endangered uh now because of uh climate change or the the law for example like uh, Handmade cheese, uh, Brazilian handmade cheese. What is that? Because it's it's a it's a cheese like uh, uh, it's it's a kind of cheese that you produce with raw milk. And uh, in the in the case of Brazil, it's uh, in in uh, you know in general. Uh, this kind of uh, uh, production is prohibited. Oh wow! It's not allowed because the the argument is is not uh, is not uh, sani sanitary. Not sanitary That's enough. Not, they don't pass the milk. They don't uh, yeah like heat it up and kind of uh, make it so it's you know okay to use. They just yeah. take the raw milk. <laughs> I, I think the main reason is because there are not uh, there are not enough uh, people to 
to see the production of uh, because this product uh, this this uh, producers are very small mm. very regional or local producers that uh, yeah. the government has not the the ability or the resources to see to follow their yeah. production but in general and that's the point you know uh I don't know in the United States, but in Brazil, I think the 6% of, uh, of our GDP is originated by medium and small businesses. Mm. Yeah, I know that in the United States, they have a lot of big farms. I mean, big farms. And the small farmer doesn't have that much impact on the economy, uh, mm -hmm. on the local economy. Like... You know, here we have fetas. You know, it's a, mm -hmm. a place where you 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 can take your your produce and you can sell your grapes, your oranges, your apples. You can take all your things to the market and sell it. Of course, you need to talk to the people who are responsible for the market to you know get your ability to mm -hmm. sell in the market. But this exists a lot in Brazil. It doesn't exist as much in the United States. In the United States, it's more of the the big supermarkets. Uh, mm -hmm. We do have the small, uh, we call city market or the street market. We have them, but it's not very many around the nation. They have them in some of the big cities because people like to go to buy organic uh, products, you know, vegetables mm -hmm. and fruits. And they have them in some smaller areas, some, some smaller towns, but it's not common all year round. Especially like in my area where I grew up in Michigan, it's not possible. It's snowing, man. <laughs> You don't have an outdoor uh, in the middle of the winter for <laughs> you know fruits and vegetables. So you know it's mainly supermarkets, and then that comes to the big farms. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about wine. Is like, that's mm -hmm. the topic you like? <laughs> I found yeah. some information here about wine produced in uh, Brazil, and so I wanted to share that real quick with you. I'm going to share my screen so we can have this as a topping a talking point here. So I, I said, um, what are some of the nice wines, most popular wine in Brazil? They said sparkling wine is Brazil's mm -hmm. shining star. But the country actually produces yeah. more still wines, like red and white wines. So yeah. that's 50, 53% is red wine. Merlot is the most popular. And then I said, okay, what wines are made in Brazil? And they put down red wines made from Cabernet, Sauvignon. Uh, Merlot, Tal, and Pinot. How do you pronounce that? Pinot Noir. Uh, Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir. And it's yeah. one of the wines from Chardonnay, Muscat, in Italian Riesling. So they have a lot of wines, more than three thousand actually. And the wines yeah. are basically based on a uh, vineyard or a group of vineyards in a region region that creates a particular wine for that area. And yeah. so there are like 3,000 different wines <laughs> made in Brazil. That's crazy, man. I didn't know that. And then Brazil yeah. wine country cover, covers 40% of South America. Um, or no, the Brazil wine country that covers 40% of South America is the third largest wine producer. We know that Argentina and Chile produce more wine than Brazil, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, they. I, I think they produce more, and uh, the brands that uh, they have, respectively, in their markets are uh, more uh, maybe uh, well known around yeah. the world than uh, Brazilian wine. Yeah, but Brazil yeah. wines, I know, I remember, but I don't remember the exact name. But there have been some Brazil wines, Brazilian wines, that have won awards, international awards for being mm -hmm. excellent. So that's very cool. And I, I said, okay, what is the wine capital of Brazil? Well, it's Serra Gaúcha. Yeah. <laughs> so it was interesting <laughs> to see this information about Brazil. Brazil made yeah. a lot of wine, actually. Not as much as yeah. people in Argentina, but they have some good wines. I know, like I said, some have won international competitions. So that's very cool. Yeah, yeah, for sure. In fact, our sparkling, sparkling wine, as you said, uh, it's our state of art 
of art wine, you know, uh, very good, re renowned, and he recognized around the world and uh, won a lot of uh, contests, you know. But uh, on the other hand, we are seeing um, an important uh, increasing of uh, red wine as well. And uh, for example, I visited uh, one month or two months ago in the region of uh, Serra, Serra da Mantiqueira. It's a region that is near to the border of Sao Paulo and Minas Gerais. Mm. Uh, which uh, exist, exist um, some vineyards, and one of them was uh, recognized was, uh, as a uh, best Siha in the world, the number one, by the Cantor. The Cantor is a uh, a, 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 a magazine and an institution that uh, you know used to uh, to taste and to recognize the best class wines mm -hmm. and producers. Mm -hmm. So our industry is little by little recognized uh, around the world. Mm -hmm. So I think our our um weather our tehoa you know the weather and the 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 land the soil um is very are very proper to produce grapes to 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 you know um uh, and to make wine mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I go around uh, Sao Paulo, where I live, and you live too. I've been to Medeiro, yeah. I've been to Sao Hockey, and I've been to some different places, and they have some nice vineyards. Yeah. And wines. I mean, I, I don't know how it compares to all the other wines. I, I really cannot distinguish the taste anymore. I've lost the ability to, to have mm -hmm. a fine sense of taste and smell, but I know it tastes good, okay? It tastes mm -hmm. good to me. Especially with good food, like you said, they go together. Yeah, food, good wine. Uh, what is your favorite wine, Juvenile? Uh, I, I do not have a favorite wine, you know, because I don't know. It's it's so particular, uh, and uh, it depends on the moment. That's the point. Uh, uh, for example, uh, to follow a very strong. Uh, Dish, for example, uh, red meat or something like that. I prefer Tana, which is a, uh, a grape that is more produced in Uruguay. Mm -hmm. But uh, Cabernet, for me, it's very good. Pinot uh, follow, uh, follow fishes. Mm -hmm. And what about chicken? Chicken. I think uh, white wine like mm -hmm. uh, Sauvignon or maybe Chardonnay because they have a uh, a little uh, acidity acidity that okay. uh, acidity that complement uh, very well um, the white meat because it's a a, a little how can I say sweety if I can say that sweet. Yeah. Okay. If you yeah. if you pay attention on this, you you can see that uh, red meat is more acid, acid, acidic. Yeah, acid, acidic. Okay. and uh, the white meat on the in, in the opposite is more sweety, you know. Okay. But it's very it's very subtle. Okay. <laughs> so, um, what about cheese? What what is a good cheese to go with some wine? Does it depend on the wine and the cheese too? The combination? Yeah, yeah, because you have strong cheese like, like uh, the cheeses. 
Yeah, for 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 example, for Google Gonzalez, uh, I think uh, not a strong wine because the strong wine and the strong cheese they will fight on your mouth and uh, for your taste. <laughs> That's the point. And, and what food? What food would you eat? Uh, eat with Porto. No, Porto, it's uh, it's like a liquor, you know? Oh, liqueur. And, uh, yeah, like a, a liqueur. And uh, it's good to to finish some meal or to start. Or... I have a friend. I have a friend, and he has a rule. If you open a bottle of Porto, you need to drink the bottle of Porto at that same day, that same moment. <laughs> uh, I, I agree with, with him. <laughs> And Porto's not cheap. It's a little bit expensive. Yeah, yeah. But that's sure. his rule. He says, if we're going to open the bottle, <laughs> we're going to drink it to the end. Okay? So we have yeah. three guys. Three guys are going to drink this bottle. It's like, <laughs> woo! It's a lot of wine. <laughs> and that's a strong yeah, wine. Yeah. Not a, like a regular wine. It's like, like you said, a liqueur. Yeah. Yeah. It's a strong wine. And, uh, so I drank I drank some and he drank a lot. It's like, okay. <laughs> Yeah, just to compare, a normal red wine, for example, it's around uh, 13% of uh, alcohol. Right. But to Porto is around 17, 17.5%. Yeah, a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. So it's not terrible, but it's a little stronger. A little stronger. Yeah, sure. Very good. So the wine and the cheese and the food all go together. Uh, normally, I mean, people do drink wine by itself. I mean, but normally it's it's leading into the food or it's accompanying the food or it's after the food. It's like, it can be anyway. It's your choice, but um, it normally goes with food and with cheese. Normally it's cheese and wine to begin and then maybe a different wine with the food that you know complement each other so it's very interesting how this comes together and i know you like to cook too right yes yes <laughs> it's my it's my passion uh -huh. and you know i i agree with macron the president of france that uh he used to say it's a little bit sad yes. to have a meal without uh, wine and uh -huh. I agree. I completely agree, a hundred percent. Yeah. So I mean, you know, the Germans they love their beer, but a lot of Germans like wine too. I mean, they have a large uh, yeah. wine growing region, which is the Mosel River, the Rhine River, um, and I've tasted those wines. They're very good. They're mostly white wines, but excellent wines, excellent. So yeah, you know, they drink a lot of beer compared to the French. Probably French drink more wine, but um any alcohol is fine with me but in limitation i don't need a lot of alcohol that's for sure yeah the, i think it's uh like uh our marketing used to say drink moderately <laughs> yes moderation that's the key moderation yeah yeah yes so it's good to talk about this subject today um talking about wine talk about economics talk about supply and demand talk about food travel okay it's all good yes yeah uh, this is sure. what we do we talk about different topics and we discuss the pros the cons but uh we like to discuss things and to help you with your english that's what we're doing we're coming here with english brazil trying to help everybody with their english with listening because listening is 50 percent of communication so it's your moment to listen but you're always welcome to join us in the in this discussion that we have so if you want, give us a ring. We'll set it up. You guys can come and participate. So just wanted to say thank you again, Juvenal, for this time. That uh, was a pleasure, as usual. So we'll do it again next week, okay? Yeah, for sure. So take care. See you later. Bye-bye, everybody. You too. Bye-bye.